Good morning, boys and girls. Carolyn and I are excited to be with you today again. I really miss seeing you all. I can't wait till we get back together. I was thinking, let's give each other a really big smile on the count of three. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> okay, okay, that's enough. Let's everybody sing countdown. Are you ready? Ten, nine, nine eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Blast off! Somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for those who trust Him and obey. Jesus will come again, and though we don't know when, the countdown's getting lower every day. Ten and nine, eight and seven, six and five and four, call upon the Savior while you may. Three and two, coming through the clouds in bright array, the countdown's getting lower every day. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, blast off! Whisper a prayer in the morning, whisper a prayer at noon, whisper a prayer in the evening to keep your heart in tune. Because God answers prayer in the morning, God answers prayer at noon, God answers prayer in the evening, so keep your heart in tune. Because Jesus may come in the morning, Jesus may come at noon, Jesus may come in the evening, so keep your heart in tune. Okay, at this time, Miss Carolyn's coming with a special Bible lesson. Well, welcome back, boys and girls. I have a question for you this morning. I always have questions. What is your favorite body part? Is it your hair? Is it your nose? Maybe it's your fingernails? But what's the most important body part you have? If you had to lose one body part, what would it be? Would it be your feet, your ears? Not your brain, I'm sure. It's a pretty tough choice to make. Well, because <clears throat> we need all of our body parts uh, to work together to accomplish what the body is intended to accomplish, what God made the body to accomplish. A body is a, different, is a group of different parts put together for a purpose. <clears throat> the Bible teaches us that the church is a body of believers. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. It's not a building. A building's a place where people gather. Um, they got, we gather there as a church body to to worship, to pray, to learn, and to fellowship. You know, we often say, maybe Sunday mornings you might say, we're going to church. <clears throat> what would be the right way to say that? Maybe we should say, we're going to the worship service. Or we could say we're going different times to a prayer meeting, or we're going to a Bible study, or we're going to Sunday school, or fellowship time. But remember, the church is not a building. It's a body, a group of different believers joined together for a purpose. And that's what we're going to look at today. You've already learned how the church body began. It began at Pentecost. <clears throat> uh, and there are four things that a church body, that a church, um, body does. And I'm going to read to you from Acts 2, verse 42. And they devoted, this is the first church body, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's learning, 
and the fellowship, you know what that is, to the breaking of bread, that's communion, and the prayers. Things that a church body does, and those are some of them. Well, then you learned from Miss Bonnie last week about some things that we find a church body doing. God used Peter, who was a member of the church body, when God healed that lame man. Remember that last week? Then God used Peter to spread the gospel. Remember, 5,000 people got saved. That's one purpose of the church body. Then the church body shared hard times. Do you remember Peter and John were imprisoned? And the church body prayed together. They prayed together and they prayed for each other. They prayed for Peter and John. A church body is united in spirit, and they were too. They, were, they shared their goods with each other, with those that needed it. That first church body started, started um, by selling. They would sell some of the individuals, would sell some of their belongings, and they'd give that to the church body uh, for those in need. Who are those in need? People like widows who had no one to take care of them. Uh, people like that lame man. Uh, people who can't earn a living. And uh, missionaries, like Peter in this case. And now we are in chapter 5 of Acts, and we're going to meet somebody new. I'm going to put Peter up here, but the man we're going to meet that's new is named Ananias. What's his name? Ananias. Ananias had something worth money, some land. And he decided to sell it so that he could give that money to the church body of believers. People were doing that. They would come into the uh, building and they would bring money to the church leaders that could be shared with those that, need, that needed it. But Ananias and his wife, his wife's name was Sapphira. What was her name? Sapphira. They planned to lie. They plan to keep some of that money for themselves, not give the whole amount to them, to um, the church body. Now, there were no rules about how much they could give. The giving was to be from the heart. But they lied. They cheated. They robbed God. They tried to look more godly than they really were, pleasing themselves, not pleasing God. When those in the body sin against God and each other, there's no more unity of spirit. And that body can't do all that it's intended to do. Well, Ananias took the money. He took it to the church leaders. And he handed it on to Peter. And Ananias said this. We sold our land, and here is all the money that we got for it. That was not true, was it? No. Well, God the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter that Ananias was lying. Peter said this, Ananias, why did you let Satan fill your heart to lie to God? You aren't just lying to us, you're lying to God. And just like that, Ananias fell down dead. And some young men in, in the room wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. Three hours later, not knowing any of this that had already happened, Ananias' wife, what was her name? Sapphira. Sapphira came on in. This was a little bit later. Maybe the boys and girls weren't there anymore. Sapphira came on in, and Peter said to Sapphira, Tell me, did you sell your, your land for this amount of money? Oh, yes, we sold it for that amount, Sapphira said. Why did you, Peter said, why did you and Ananias agree together to tell a lie to God and us? Those men about to come in the door, they're, they just buried your husband, and now they're going to do the same for you. And just like that, she dropped dead too, and they carried her out and buried her. Boys and girls, what we learn here is, <clears throat> first of all, do right till the stars fall, but also that the church is a body, united in spirit, praying together, sharing, and many other things such as worshiping together. That's one of the most important. 
Now, we can't worship in the church building, can we, right now? But we can worship together, and we do that on the Internet, don't we? Yes, we don't want to forget to do that. The, God wants us to do that. <clears throat> but what can we learn from this? First of all, if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, excuse me, <clears throat> I've got this little cough I need to get rid of. <clears throat> there. If you're a believer, a child of God already, if you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you're a necessary part of the body, of the body of Christ. Each part, each person is needed. Each person has a task. Are you serving? How can you serve? Look for ways. Look for opportunities to be used in the body. But if you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you're not part of the body yet. But we like you being with us, and we love you and look forward to when you trust in Jesus and become a part of this body of believers, this family of God. Meanwhile, remember that labor man, that labor man, that lame man, handicapped man? Like him, if you've never trusted in Jesus as your Savior, like him, you're spiritually lame. Your faith in yourself can't hold you up. God wants to heal that part of you. God wants to heal your soul. He wants to save your soul. Let me read what another verse in Acts, this chapter, this book that we're in. This is in chapter 2, verse 21. The Bible says, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Boys and girls, if you've never done that, call on him to save you today. Miss Cindy, let's sing another song. You know, what Miss Carolyn was talking about reminded me of a song. The song is called Do Right. <clears throat> From the very start, have purpose in your heart to do what's right and never question why. Never count the cost, though everything seem lost. The price for doing right is sometimes high. Do right till the stars fall. Do right till the last call. Do right when there's no one else to stand by you. Do right when you're all alone. Do right, though it's never known. Do right, since you love the Lord. Do right, do right. Thank you, boys and girls. You know, I have a special story I'm going to start. And I wanted to tell you that it's a true story. And so all the events and things that happen in the story are true. And it's about a little girl named Mary. And the story starts out where she's around all of the ages of you. So my favorite thing about this story is that Mary is just ordinary, like you and me. It's not like she's the best person at the games outside. It's not like she's the smartest one in the class, knows all the English and the math. I'm terrible at math. Anyway. She's just not, there's nothing that stands out about her that's very special. But when I go through the story, what you're going to find out is there's a lot that's special about Mary's God. And we'll find out about the story of Mary. Let me tell you a little bit about her. Mary was born in Aberdeen, Scotland. So that's across the Atlantic Ocean from us, right across there. And that's where she grew up. And Aberdeen, Scotland is a very poor town at the time Mary grew up. And at the beginning of our story, what's happening is Mary and her mother are sitting at home very late at night, about 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. Most of us are in bed at that time. Even though it's hot in that room because of the big fire that's blazing at the fireplace, Mary and her mother are very nervous. They're looking at the doorway when the reason because is the doorway gets kicked open and in walks Mary's dad. He's very drunk. He's very angry. He's cursing. He's bragging. 
And Mrs. Slesser right there, she gets up and she says, Robert, um, did you bring any money home this week? And he takes out of his pocket and goes slams on the table a three-penny piece. Probably today that would be about $3. And I don't think $3 would go very far for Mary had six brothers and sisters that were younger than her. Do you think that would go very far for clothes, the rent of this home, for food? No, boys and girls, that's not going to go very far at all. If you and your mom go to the store next time, you look around at some of those prices. They don't have very much money at all for their family. Well, Mrs. Slesser carefully climbed the stairs to go to bed, kind of sad. And Mary sat there just staring at her dad. And he walked over to her, and this is hard, but he slapped her in the face. And it's not because Mary did anything. It's because he's under the control of alcohol or he's very drunk. He doesn't really realize what he's doing. And the next thing he did is he took Mary by the arm, and he just pushed her outside the door, shut the door, and locked it. So here we have Mary outside in the dark, and they live in a very poor part of town. And she's just, Father, please let me in. She says, I'll be a good girl. Mother, help. She's all upset. She's all distraught. And the next thing that happened was her father threw water down on top of her out of the window. Here she is freezing and sobbing and not knowing what to do. She starts to go door to door in their little alley where they live. And all the doors are locked. Finally, she finds a little place along the fence. And she stays there the rest of the night. As the morning rose over the North Sea there in Aberdeen, Scotland, she saw her dad go out to work. He was a totally different person today because he wasn't drunk anymore. So on his way to work, he just walked slowly, his head hanging down. Anyway, off he went. So Mary ran home, and she ran straight into the embrace of her mother, who was so warm and comfortable. And Mary's mother said, Mary, I'm so sorry that we had to do that last night. I'm so sorry. But right now we have a lot to do. Got to get the other children up. Got to get them dressed. We got to help them and prepare for our day. So that's what they did. Well, in Mary's neighborhood, there lived an older lady. And she loved to bake things. And she loved to have all the children in. And they would come in and get warm. And she would divide all her cookies up amongst them. And they loved this lady. And this lady loved God. But she didn't know how to tell the children of how good and loving God was. She, she would tell them about how God punishes them if they don't do right. Well, she tried to tell the little children about Jesus. So she just would, she loved them and she grabbed Mary by the hand because she had noticed Mary had been acting more wild and more mischievous and she was worried about her. So she grabbed her by the hand. Mary, she said, God's going to punish you if you don't ask him to forgive you of your sins and confess them. Well, Mary went home that night and she didn't sleep. She couldn't sleep at all. All she could think about was all that sin, you know, the bad things you think about and things that you do and the things that you say. She just kept thinking about them over and over. So she got down beside her bed and she said, Jesus, I want to trust you and believe in you and I want to ask you to forgive me of my sin. So she did just that. And she started reading her Bible And one of her friends came over, and she liked to tell people about Jesus, too. One of her friends came, and they said, Mary, do you have a book I could borrow? And Mary said, sure. Um, I only have one book. It's the Bible, but it's made a new girl out of me. And she loaned that girl the Bible. At this time in her life, too, Mary's father died. And what that did for Mary was she had to get up at 5 in the morning I don't know how many of you do that. She's about still around 11 years old. Now, I want you to think about this, boys and girls. She gets up at 5 in the morning. She goes to work now from about 6 o'clock till noon, eats a really quick lunch, goes to middle school for another six hours, gets home about 6.30 at night, and then she helps her mother feed the children, helps them all get in bed. She didn't have a lot of time to play, did she? 
Well, as we go on in our story, but that's what Mary's doing. She's really helping get the money on the, for the mom so they could feed and clothe the children. Their favorite time of the week, though, was Sunday because Mary would get such encouragement from hearing the preacher tell about God and how wonderful God is and who God is. Well, one time there was a missionary visiting there at the church, and the missionary said, well, I'm going to tell you about Africa. On that continent, there is a place called Nigeria, and in that place, there's a land called Calabar. So can you say that with me? Calabar? Yeah. Well, at that place, it's one of the worst spots on the whole earth, and here's why. It's because it's a land of skin diseases and high fevers and malaria from mosquito bites. It has like people wanting to do witchcraft and poisoning each other and people even eating each other. Oh, it's just a scary place to be. And you know what Mary thought in her heart? God's done so much for me, and he's been so good to me. I want to do something for him. She's thinking, I can't go to Calabar, but boy, I sure would like to. And then the thought came to her, why don't you just tell people about Jesus and they right, right here where you are? And so she started, the church at that time bought this little room on Queen Street, which was the hardest place in the whole town. It was where the poorest were and where all the gangs of boys were and where evil people were. It was just a place where people didn't know about Jesus. And so she said, went right up to the person, the mission person, and said, can I teach the Bible? Can I, can I tell people about Jesus there in that little room? So every night, after she went to work and then school and helped at the house, in the night she would go over to that room and try to tell people about Jesus out of her Bible. And what would happen is the gangs of boys, they would beat girls and boys up that came over to even hear about Jesus. And they threw mud at her. Well, one night, as Mary was walking home, she didn't realize, she was like kind of lost in her thoughts, She didn't realize a gang of boys had surrounded her. And the next thing she knew, they were right in front of her. And there was a boy with a big piece of lead rock on his string. And he was swinging it like this around her head. And she's starting to pray, dear God, I don't know what to do. Please help me. So she just stood there and stared at him, praying the whole time. Well, this boy is going, he's just looking at her and he's going, stand back. Stand back. And Mary's not moving or budging an inch. She said, I'll fix your pretty face. Move. He's trying to get her to move. She just wouldn't. And she's praying the whole time. And then finally, the boy drops his thing. He stops doing this, drops it on the ground, looks at her and goes, you're a good sport. You can go anywhere you want and nobody's going to bother you. Well, Mary, she was just She stood there and she just looked at him and said, well then, why don't you come to my mission meeting tomorrow night? So the next night, all the boys show up, of course, except one. And he's trying to be helpful. So he goes out there with his whip and he's making all the other boys and girls go in. When Mary realized that, she went to the door, turned her own back around and said, hey, why don't you whip me instead? And he's like, what? She says, yes, whip me instead. And he just looked at her really puzzled. And she said, why don't you put your whip down and come in and hear what I have to say? And boys and girls, she went in to hear what he had to say. And she said, you know, Jesus died for our sin and he rose again from the dead. And that power, that resurrection power, it forgives any sin, no matter what anyone's done. And do you know that bully He accepted Jesus. He asked Jesus. He believed in him and wanted him to change his life. And he accepted him as his savior. That's exciting, isn't it? Well, Mary's growing up now in our story. And she's about 28 years old. And all that time, up till 28, she taught at that mission, at that little place that the church had rented. And she's talking to her mother here. And she says, Mom, I really, really want to go to that land of Calabar. What do you think? And Mary's mother was so excited about that. She just looked at her, smiled, and said, Mary, 
I'm really pleased that you want to go there. I'm that you want to please Jesus and serve him. I'm, I want you to go. What's interesting about this, boys and girls, is there were other of their friends that would say things like, hey, your mission works great. Why don't you just, the money you're making, give to the mission instead of going. Mary, they said, there's people that eat people there. They're going to eat you. So she got all kinds of people telling her all kinds of things about not to go. You know what Mary did? She looked right back at them, and she said, you know, I know God wants me to go, and you can do my mission work, but I'm going to go to the land of Calabar. So she trained at that time to do some nurse things. It took her some time. And here she is on a boat to the land of Calabar. And what's exciting, it's exciting to think God's with her the whole time. Boys and girls, why is she going to Calabar? She's going there because she knows those people, those in that land, don't know anything about Jesus. And she wants to tell them about the love of God that changed her whole life. And she doesn't know what's going to happen. She doesn't know what she's going to face. But in the stories to come, we'll share some of those things with you. At this time, Miss Carolyn's going to come. What a good story. I wonder what's going to happen next, boys and girls. With that. Well, do something for me. Clap your hands with one hand behind your back. That doesn't work, does it? How about... Can you build something with Legos without using all of your fingers and thumbs? Well, that's kind of hard for me to do. I'm not very good at this. Nope, I don't think I can do that. How about read a book? Can you read a book with your eyes closed? No, we can't do that. Um, how about, can you introduce yourself to someone holding your tongue? That doesn't work either, does it? Because all of our body parts are needed to do what the body is supposed to do. You like my necklace? Kaylee made this for me, but she made me for me for made it for me for a purpose. It's made from lots, dozens and dozens and dozens of tiny little rubber bands. What do you think would happen if I cut this in half? would all fall apart. The pieces are falling down. Oh, it would be useless, and it is. Now it's useless as a necklace. All these little parts are needed to work together to make it what it's supposed to be. They're all needed to work together to make it do what it's designed to do. Well, boys and girls, the body of Jesus Christ, the church body, is designed by God to work together. Uh, let me read from Romans chapter 12, verse 5, says this. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members one of another. Are you part of, the, of, the, of God's family, part of the body of Christ, part of the church body? If you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, you are. Are you doing your part are you reaching out? Are you sharing? Are you praying? Are you praying for others? <coughs> Excuse me, boys and girls. Are you praying for yourself? Pray for yourself. Ask God to show you uh, how to serve. When the body, our body of believers, comes together again and is able to meet in a building, what will God have for you to do? Pray about that. Ask mom and dad for ideas, and they'll be glad to help you. Well, boys and girls, we've certainly enjoyed being with you today. See you next time.